flopping around. Just let it flop around until it flops into its stable configuration. And then we'll see what it works. <laughs> as long as you can, can stand aware of it for an hour. <laughs> and then this thing is going to be heavy, so just be aware of that. Okay. So I might want to hold it. You could let it drive, but you might want to hold it. Yeah. If you had a pocket, that would be ideal. Yeah. yeah. Sadly. Sadly. Okay. I can do it. Okay, everyone, so thank you all for coming out. We're going to do our raffle first for our t-shirt. Get your ticket out if you have one. Okay, so I am going to read the last four numbers on the ticket. The last four numbers are 3891. Okay. Welcome to Astra McGill. Uh, it's my pleasure to announce Dr. Holly Sheets, who is a postdoctoral researcher here at McGill Space Institute and at IREX. And she's, uh, she works on exoplanets, and she's going to be talking to us today about the strange new worlds discovered by Kepler. So thank you. OK. Uh, is it working? Do we have sound? How's that? Everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for coming. Welcome to the Public Astro Night. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk about the surprising variety of exoplanets. Um, so exoplanets are planets that orbit stars other than our sun. Uh, the surprising variety of exoplanets that the Kepler mission has uncovered. To understand what makes some of the Kepler systems so unusual, though, we'll need to review what we knew about planets and planet formation prior to the discoveries of these planets. So um, in this talk, I'll review how our sample of known planets has, um, I'll review how our sample of known planets in the solar system has changed over time, and uh, how we think the solar system formed, um, how finding the first exoplanets conflicted with that view. So I'll also discuss then the Kepler mission and uh, finishing with a selection of specific interesting systems that Kepler has found. So for most of human history, we knew of only one planet, Earth. Ancient peoples, once they began monitoring the motions of the, the heavens uh, more carefully, noted that there were five particularly bright looking stars that seemed to move with respect to the rest of the stars. Although this seemed to move with a predictable pattern. So three of those particularly bright stars are shown in this image here. Our word planet, in fact, actually derives from uh, the Greek phrase wandering, meaning wandering stars. So with Galileo's de development of the telescope around 1609 though, these wandering points of light seem to be no longer point-like. Surfaces and features became visible and it became clear that these little points of light were actually other worlds entirely separate from Earth um, and that Earth was only one of six planets orbiting the sun. These images behind me, of course, are, are from instruments that are much more advanced than uh, what Galileo had, <laughs> of course. Um, and so it's also important to point out that these are, are not to scale. <laughs> so uh, in the upper left, we have Jupiter. Um, and upper right, we have Saturn. Uh, let's see if I have a pointer, do I? Yes, sweet. Um, so Jupiter and Saturn on the top, those are our two gas giants. They're mo made mostly of hydrogen and helium. They're about 10 times bigger in size than the Earth. And then across the bottom, we have Mars, we have Venus in the middle, and we have Mercury. These are all small. Um, they're a little bit smaller than the Earth. They're mostly made of rock and metal, just like Earth is. And so further study of the night sky with telescopes actually added Uranus here um, in 1781. And then in 1846, Neptune was also found. Um, 
So that adds to our, our other sample of the easier to spot planets. And I just want to point out that this little bright spot here on Uranus is not actually on Uranus. It's one of Uranus's moons, Ariel. So it's passing in front of the planet, and then that's actually the shadow of the moon being cast against the planet. So Uranus and Neptune are both gas giants as well, like Jupiter and Saturn. But unlike Jupiter and Saturn, they're a little bit smaller. They're only about four times the Earth instead of four times the size of the Earth instead of uh, ten. So also in the 1800s, we started. We found hundreds of um, members of the asteroid belt. So two of them are shown here. Um, these are images from the recent Dawn mission. So on the left is Ceres. And so you'll note that Ceres is round. So Ceres is actually big enough that its own gravity can pull itself into a, a spherical shape. Um, on the right is Vesta, which is a little bit smaller and doesn't, doesn't quite pull off the, the spherical shape. Um, and finally, in 1930, we found what is the first member of the Kuiper Belt, everybody's favorite, Pluto, um, shown here in an iconic image from the recent New Horizons mission. So by 1990, um, this was our picture of the solar system. You have four planets on the inside. So you have the four planets close to the sun, where it's nice and warm. And they're all small and rocky. And then in the outer part of the system, you have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the big gas giants, where it's nice and cold. And then you have Pluto out here. And we didn't know of any other Kuiper Belt objects at the time, but we suspected that the Kuiper Belt was there. Um, and there's also another cloud of, ob of icy remnants, like the Kuiper Belt, that's a little bit further out, that's not shown on this diagram. Um, that we suspected were there as basically the source of comets that we see coming into the solar system on, on occasion. Um, but we didn't actually have any other observations of things out there yet. And then we also have the asteroid belt, which is sort of the leftover remnants of the uh, rocky planets. OK, so why do we have these two types of planets? And why do they seem so nicely spaced, grouped in space? Uh, we, uh, we think it has something to do with how the solar system actually formed. And so we'll consider that model. The solar system actually started out as part of a much larger uh, cloud of gas and dust, similar to these clouds here. So this is a, a, it's an iconic Hubble image, uh, often called the Pillars of Creation. So it's showing uh, vast amounts of gas and dust that are, are just kind of hanging out in space, being sculpted by some of the newly forming stars around it. Uh, in Various little pieces of this cloud, they're probably going to start to collapse and form, form new stars. And disturbances from other stars forming tend to uh, set different parts of the cloud collapsing. And so we actually think the formation of our own solar system started, um, it was probably set off by a nearby supernova that exploded. So as the cloud just begins to collapse, you get a disk forming. Most of the material, 99% or so, will actually go into the sun itself. And then the rest, that last percent, is in the disk. And out of that, you'll form the planets. And so the inner part of the disk is nice and warm, because it's close to the sun as it's forming. And you end up with rocky, rocky and metally bits um, to form the planets out of. But the outer solar system has ice along with the rock and the metal. So there's a lot more material available to form planets. So we think that the outer solar system, the planets form bigger, faster. And that allows them to um, gather up lots of gas from the disk. So the inner part, the inner planets have, are too small to hang on to gas. And so they just stay rocky. The outer planets start gathering all this gas to them and end up being much, much larger, the gas giants. And then finally, once the sun finishes forming, you get uh, the remaining gas blown away, both by the solar wind, which is just a stream of particles, mostly protons, that flows off of the sun. And then um, 
light from the sun can also cause pressure. It can push against things and clear it out. So between the solar wind and the, the light itself, the disk clears and you get the leftover rocky material winding up in a belt between the rocky planets and the gas giants. And then the icier remnants end up out in the Kuiper belt beyond the gas giants and possibly further out in the distant Oort cloud. So we have these two types of planets, Rocky and the gas giants, and they're grouped together in space because the gas giants need a lot of ice to add to the material, to, to grow them, to make them big enough to hold on to the gas. So the four rocky planets, it's too warm there to have large amounts of ice, so they don't get very large. So do we have any evidence that this formation process, starting from a disk, occurs elsewhere? So by 1990, we did actually have a small amount of evidence. So we knew that there were four nearby stars that had uh, an excess, um, that had dis dust around them in a disk. Uh, one of those stars is shown here, Beta Pictoris. This is a newer, it's a more recent uh, image than, than 1990, but uh, what you see here, first of all, the, the color is, it's a false color image just to emphasize the contrast so that you can see um, the, the details doesn't actually look like this. <laughs> um, so this is a bigger image of the full disk and you see the size of Pluto's orbit to get a sense of the scale, of how, how it compares to our solar system. And then with another instrument, so this is, these are both instruments on, on Hubble Space Telescope. Um, you get a zoom in um, closer. So you see the disk, which is, is edge on to our, to our view. And then you block out the light in the middle from the star so that you can see the much, much fainter disk. And uh, so they noticed, later they noticed in the disk that there are these odd sort of features which people, uh, people suspected might be indica indicative of planets actually being in the disk, disturbing things a little bit. Um, and, by, and, and actually in 2008, uh, with better instrumentation, a uh, planet was actually found within the disk. Uh, but we're, we're kind of jumping ahead there, so, so let's go back to the early 90s again when we're just starting to find evidence that these disks might be common and before we found any, any actual extrasolar planets. So in 1992, the Hubble Space Telescope um, provided the first images of dusty, gas-rich disks in, around newly forming stars, um, which are some of the little blobs in this image. So we'll come back to these guys. Uh, these disks were seen in the Orion, the star forming region of the Orion Nebula. Uh, the Orion Nebula is located in the, the sword of the constellation Orion. And so this is the original image of the nebula taken before Hubble had uh, corrected, Hubble was corrected for the slight mirror defect that it had when it launched. So fortunately, since Hubble is in Earth orbit, uh, astronauts, when we had the shuttle program, astronauts could reach the, the telescope and actually make repairs, make changes on the instrumentation. So we were able to correct for the problem that was making the images a little bit blurry. Uh, and the new instrument resulted in much prettier pictures. So this is the nebula again. It's a little bit bigger than the previous image, but also the detail is a lot clearer. And so we get uh, clearer images of these little disks. And so in this image, there are five newly formed stars, uh, four of which have disks around them. And so these three disks are being lit up by stars that are nearby. And then uh, this disk is actually seen in silhouette. It's being backlit by the nebula. And there's a tiny little point in the middle that's red. That's actually the star that's forming at the center. So it seems like disks were plentiful in the Orion Nebula, and so that means that planet formation may indeed actually be a common phenomenon. So far, the solar nebula model is holding up pretty well. But then throwing a wrench into that model is the first exoplanets that we detected. So this is an artist's concept of 51 Pegasi b, uh, 
which is the first confirmed exoplanet around a sun-like star. It was found in 1995. And the planet's about half the mass of Jupiter, uh, but its orbit uh, around the star only takes 4.2 days. Uh, Jupiter takes about 12 years to go around the sun. So this is definitely something weird. Uh, for comparison also, Mercury, which is our innermost planet, takes 88 days to go around the sun. So 4.2 days, extremely fast, extremely close to its star. Um, 51 Peg Pegasi b and other planets like it became known as hot Jupiters because they're about a Jupiter mass, but they're really, really close to their star, which means they're being really, really heated up by it. So how did they get there? Because remember, our model has it has Jupiter-like planets forming way out in the solar system. So Jupiter is, is five times as far away from the sun as the Earth is. These things should be forming way out where it's cold. So how do you get these hot Jupiters right next to their star? So the answer seems to be that the planets can migrate. Um, there were some, they can, they can actually change their orbits over time. So there were some hints in early modeling attempts at uh, protoplanetary disks that the building blocks of planets might move around a bit as they form because they interact with the gas that's in the disk. Uh, but nobody was really expecting anything like the hot Jupiters from that. It turns out, though, that there's actually some evidence that the planets in our solar system actually migrated. Um, those rocky and icy remnants that are in the asteroid belt, the Kuiper belt, the Oort cloud, Probably some of those got there from being um, from the gas giants in our solar system moving around. And so migration can even occur after the gas in the disk is gone. The planets can interact with themselves and they can interact with all the icy and rocky little bits that are left over. So in 2005, uh, what's called the Nice model, uh, it's named for the city in France where it was developed. Um, this model, uh, showed that gravitational interactions between the four gas giants and all of the uh, remnants uh, in the belts that we see today could actually change the orbits of the planets rather spectacularly, um, which we'll see when we animate. You can skip the ad. <laughs> so um, you start out, you put the planets in. And notice that Neptune is actually inside of Uranus when it starts. We don't actually know that that was true, but uh, as you'll see from the model, it, it's plausible. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we put the planets in. We put a bunch of uh, icy remnants in the Kuiper belt, significantly more than what we actually see today. And then we start it, and we let it evolve. And you see the occasional Kuiper Belt object flying through the, the, inter, the giant gas giant planets, interacting. And then we slow it down. There's an interaction that causes everything to go unstable, and things just fly everywhere. And the orbits have changed drastically from the beginning. And now we have uh, Uranus inside of the Neptune orbit, which is what we see today. So. Uh, yeah, like I said, we don't actually know that for sure that Neptune may be started inside of the Uranus's orbit, but it's, it's a plausible scenario. Um, there are lots of different initial conditions you can use to start these models and uh, still get plausible results. So this scenario, um, when everything starts flying around the solar system, nicely explains uh, the cratering evidence that we have on the moon and Mercury. So you can date the craters, um, and we see a spike in the number of collisions that's uh, known as the late heavy bombardment. So this depicts the, the moon at the time of the late heavy bombardment when you're getting lots of impacts from things flying around in the solar system. And then the moon now is the craters that we see from, uh, as results of those collisions. And so the late heavy bombardment seems to have happened about 800 million years after the planets formed. And this uh, Nice model is a good explanation of why you had this sudden spike in, in cratering events. 
So the discovery of hot Jupiters kicked off interest, a lot of interest in this idea of planet migration, and it seems to have occurred in our own solar system. But the Doppler method that was used to find these hot Jupiters is heavily biased towards finding just such planets. Um, the Doppler method uses the Doppler effect to measure how much the star is wobbling as the planet goes around it. As you'll see in the animation. So you've experienced the Doppler effect probably anytime an ambulance or anything else with a siren drives by you. Um, as the ambulance is coming towards you, the siren sounds kind of high-pitched as it passes you and starts heading away. Um, it sounds lower pitched. So a similar effect, well, you also notice that the faster the ambulance is driving, the more noticeable the effect is. So a similar thing happens with light. Can I restart this a little? So a similar thing happens with light. So as the planet and the star orbit each other, when the star is coming towards us, the light from the star looks a little bit bluer. And when it moves away from us, it looks a little bit redder. Now, unlike the sirens, this effect is not actually noticeable to the eye. Uh, you need very precise equipment to measure this effect. And so because, it's, it's, um, because it requires precise equipment, it's difficult to monitor a lot of stars for this effect at the same time. So it makes it hard to search for things. It's very slow going. Um, also, so as I said, this method is biased towards large close planets like the hot Jupiters. That's because close in planets create a stronger signal than planets that are further away. Um, so the, the closer the planet is to the star, the faster the planet is orbiting the star. And so that means the faster that the, the star is being tugged around. So you get a larger signal that way. But also, more massive planets have a stronger effect because they're pulling harder on their star. And um, so it's wobbling faster again, and you get a higher signal. So if you're looking for, if you want to know how common other types of planets are, you need to try a different method. So instead, we're looking to the transit method. In this method, you monitor the light from the star. So you just watch how much light you get from the star. And as the planet passes in front of the star, which we'll see in a second, uh, which is known as a transit, as the planet transits the star, you get a drop in the amount of light. And then it comes back up again uh, when the planet is away from the, in front of the star. And as you can see, so let's get the planets back. So larger planets create a bigger dip because they're blocking out more of the star. But you can still see the little planets, too. And it's important to note that what we're, we're literally just measuring how much light we get from the star. We're not actually directly imaging the, the planets. So this is the scenario that's happening in space way far away from us that we can't actually see. All we see is just the change in the amount of light that we get. Um, trying to see a, a planet next to its star uh, is kind of like trying to see a firefly that's sitting on a lighthouse from several miles out to sea. So it's, it's, it's a really hard problem. We are tackling it. We are getting there. Um, but to see really close planets like we're interested in, um, like Earth-like planets, we, we, still, we still have a little ways to go on that technology. <laughs> um, so the Kepler mission was designed to use the transit method. It was launched in March of 2009, and it was really designed to answer the question of how common smaller planets are, and more specifically, how common Earth twins are. In this context, by an Earth twin, uh, we mean that the planet has to be the same size as Earth. It has to orbit in the habitable zone of its star. The habitable zone is just uh, a region around the star where the planet gets enough light from the star to be warm enough to have liquid water on its surface. Um, so we need a planet that's about the size of Earth. It has to be in the habitable zone of a sun-like star. So the habitable, sorry, 
Um, so Kepler, for four years, stared at this single field. There, there are multiple cameras, but they're all staring at the same field. Um, it stared at the field for four years. So this field is actually located in the constellations of Cygnus and Lyra. Uh, and it's actually kind of partly in the asterism that's known as the Summer Triangle. So it's called the Summer Triangle because they're the three brightest stars in the area of the sky. And you see them when they're, they're um, during the summer, they're overhead for most of the summer. Um, it's a little too early in the summer yet to see them, but if you, um, later in the summer, if you go out, you should be able to see the three brightest stars from within the city. Uh, and those stars are Vega, which is the brightest star in Lyra, Deneb, which is the brightest star in Cygnus, and then Altair, which is the brightest star in Aquila. So those you can see probably even from downtown, but if you go out to a nice dark sky site, you could even see a little hint of the Milky Way that's um, draped behind in the background here. So what did Kepler find? Uh, it turns out that the most common size of planet, or one of the, the most common sizes of planets, is actually something in between Earth and Neptune, which is about 3.88 times the radius of Earth. So there are a whole bunch of planets that Kepler found that are in the middle. And since we have nothing like that in the solar system, we really have no idea what these things are or how they, they got to be that size. Um, so Kepler has found, besides these, this unusual size planet, Kepler's also found compact multi-planet systems, planets that orbit binary stars. Uh, there are planets in orbits of less than a day. There are planets that are twice as old as our solar system. And so I'll highlight some of those more interesting systems now. So we'll start with Kepler 22b, which is um, the first confirmed planet that actually lies in the habitable zone of its star. Uh, it's 2.4 times the radius of the Earth, though, so it's one of those weird, we have no real analog in the solar system. It's probably not rocky, but it's probably not quite like Neptune either, um, with a large atmosphere of hydrogen. So these sub-Neptunes, they're kind of, they're sometimes called, um, they may actually be water worlds. So one possible scenario, how these things form, they could form out in the cooler part of the disk, where they build up a lot of ice, and so they're mostly like, they're half ice, half rock, and then instead of gathering a lot of gas, they migrate inwards, they get warm, the water melts, or the ice melts, and you end up with a planet that's half water. Um, Earth, of course, seems kind of wet, right? We have the big oceans and everything, but it turns out that the mass of water um, in Earth, it's only, it's less than a tenth of a percent of the mass of Earth. So we're actually really quite dry. Um, so this artist's impression of what a water world might look like, you'd have really deep oceans, you might have some clouds. Um, oh, and a comment on just the naming, because we're going to see a lot of numbers coming up. Um, so when a planet that Kepler has found has been confirmed to be a planet, it gets a number. That number is whatever it is in the order of planets that have been found. So this is the 22nd planet that Kepler found to be confirmed. And then the first planet, the planet that's closest to the star, will get a letter, B. And if there are more planets in the system, they just keep getting lettered, C, D, E, etc., cetera, uh, as you go out away from the star. OK, so that's our water world. Kepler 10b is awesome because it was the first definitely rocky exoplanet that we found. So it orbits a star that's about 11 billion years old, so it's about, it's a little more than twice as old as our sun, and it orbits 20 times closer to its star than Mercury is to our sun. So it's about three times the mass of the Earth and about uh, 1.5 times the radius, but it takes only 20 hours 
to complete an orbit around its star. So our year is 365 days, right? Uh, 20 hours <laughs> is its year. And uh, that means it's, it's so close to its star, it's really hot. So we think that probably the one side is always facing the star, the other side um, is never facing the star. And it's so hot that this side that faces the star may actually even be just a ocean of lava. The, the rock is so hot that it, it just melts. Kepler 10b also is not alone around its star. It also has Kepler 10c, which is in a 45 day orbit, so a little longer. Uh, it's 17 times the mass of the Earth, uh, and again, about 2.4 times the radius. So like Kepler-22b, it might be one of these water worlds. Um, it, we know from the mass and the radius that it, it definitely cannot be a large hydrogen atmosphere like Neptune. Um, and it's probably not rocky either. So this one may be anywhere from 5% to 20% by mass um, made up of water. Um, and so... This is just the nice uh, artist's impression of it with Kepler 10b hanging out in the background. So next we have Kepler 78b, which is uh, more of a scorched earth. It's basically Kepler 10b's little sibling. Um, it's a little bit closer to Earth's size, um, and it has an even more extreme orbit than Kepler 10b. This thing is in an 8.5 hour orbit around its star. So this one may also just be a surface that's just molten lava because it's so hot. Next we have Kepler 20, 20e, which might be a volcanic planet. So this one also, um, not surprisingly, orbits close to its star. Uh, 20e is the first planet that was found that was smaller than the Earth, and it's Likely, um, because it's so close to its star, there are gravitational interactions that are probably um, making it geologically active. So you probably have active, you might have active volcanoes on the surface on both the day side and the night side, which is what the, the artist is depicting here. Next we have Kepler 138b, which is the first planet smaller than the Earth to actually have a well-determined mass and radius. So determining the mass of, of these small planets is really hard with the Doppler method because um, the signal is so small. And uh, so we get the mass, or we get the radius from, from just uh, the, the transit. And then what the artist is depicting here with these ghostly images is actually the way that the mass was determined for this planet. So there are two other planets in the system and as we saw before with the, the gas giants in our own solar system, things will interact with each other. Um, you can mess with the orbits a little bit. And so what's going on is um, if, if the planet was by itself in orbit around the star, you would get transits very regularly. You would be able to predict when they are occurring and they would, they would happen um, very, very exactly. But with the other planets in the system, what happens is the interactions between the planets will actually slow down or speed up the planet in its orbit just a little, just a little. It still stays stable enough that they're all still in orbit, but um, it will delay or um, cause the transit to occur early, which is why you get the ghostly images because you're expecting it to be here, but it's over here. Um, so, uh, since it's gravitational interaction, gravity cares about mass. You can actually figure out what the masses are of the planets that are interacting. Uh, and that's, it's a technique that's really taken off with the Kepler data set because there's so much data and it's um, accurate enough to do this kind of timing. So next we have Kepler 1520b. Uh, call it the death spiral planet. It's basically disintegrating. Uh, as it, it's, it's orbiting, it's in a circular orbit. Um, well, I, it might be circular. It's, it's definitely in an orbit. It's not spiraling into the star. But it is so close to its star that it's basically being baked off. It's evaporating. Um, you're losing a lot of rock. 
into the atmosphere, or not into the atmosphere, you're just losing it to space. And uh, so it basically has this tail, kind of like a comet, really big comet, and it's just losing rock. Um, it's actually losing rock so fast that um, it's estimated that it probably has about 200 million years left before it's just completely gone, vaporized. Um, 200 million years may sound like a long time, but if you remember that our solar system has been around for 4.6 billion years, uh, 200 million seems like we're, we're kind of lucky to be catching this happening. So next we have Kepler-11. Um, so Kepler-11 is the star that's surrounded by the planets. So there are six planets in the system. It's the first system that had as many as six planets in it. Um, it was a nice confirmation that you do get multi-planet systems like our own. Uh, but that's kind of where the similarities to our system ends. So it's the first really compact system that we found. There are five planets that all orbit on very tight, um, tightly spaced orbits. It actually would fit inside the orbit of Mercury um, in our solar system. And then there's a sixth, the sixth planet is still well inside the, the orbit of Venus. So um, not only are these multi-planet systems like ours possible, but you could actually jam a lot more things into our solar system and it would still be stable. That's what we're, we're learning from Kepler-11. Uh, Kepler-11 is also interesting because the outer four planets are probably Neptune-like, but the inner two planets are, again, possibly these water world type um, things, maybe with a little bit of hydrogen on the top. Next we have Kepler-444, which um, is a system of five Earth-sized planets, but the star that they orbit is over 11 billion years old. So that means that these planets formed when um, the universe was only about two and a half billion years old. So about two and a half billion years after the Big Bang. And um, that means that planets, Earth-sized planets, have been forming in the, the, the universe for a very long time. Um, that's important if you're hoping to find life elsewhere in the galaxy, because that means that life potentially has had a very long time somewhere to develop. Um, when Earth was forming, these planets were already as old as Earth is now. So, uh, unfortunately, these planets are probably too close to their star to actually be habitable. But uh, Everybody's favorite, the first Tatooine planet, Kepler-16b. Um, you may have noticed the travel poster earlier in the, the, before the talk started. Uh, so, like Tatooine in Star Wars, if you could stand on the surface of this planet, you would see two stars appear very close to each other in the sky. Unfortunately, uh, this planet is probably a gas giant like Neptune, so there's no real surface for you to stand on, uh, and it's way too far away from us to ever travel to anyway. <laughs> but it's important as the first evidence that we have that planets can actually form around binary stars. And that leads us to Kepler-64b, which is actually a planet that's in a four-star system. So this planet is orbiting one pair of stars, one binary star, and then, which you can see in the image here, that's the binary star that it's orbiting around. And then there's another pair of stars in the distance that's a much larger orbit away from it. But those stars are actually orbiting, <laughs> are actually orbiting around the... Um, the pair of stars with the planet. So, um, oh yes, the other really fun thing with this planet is that it was actually discovered by the citizen science project Planet Hunters. So uh, Planet Hunters uh, allows you to look at anybody, anybody can sign up to participate in the project, and it shows you data from the Kepler, uh, Kepler mission. You can look through the data, it tells you how to identify a transit, you can mark it, and if, um, if you end up finding a planet, you're one of the people who have marked the planet, and it turns out to be a real planet that nobody has found before, you actually get your name on the discovery paper, so that's fun. Um, they're still running with the Kepler data. Uh, 
Next, we have Kepler 37b, which is the smallest known confirmed planet uh, detected by Kepler so far. So it's barely bigger than our moon. It's over here. It's a little bit bigger than the moon, a little bit smaller than Mercury. Um, its year only lasts for 13 days, and its surface is hot enough to melt zinc. So there are two other planets that are shown that are also in the system. So Kepler 37c is roughly the size of Earth. D is Neptune-like, but um, both of these planets are probably also too close to their star to be habitable. Um, not sure if I mentioned that 37b is hot enough that you could probably melt zinc on its surface. Um, so here we have Kepler 36b and c. These are notable because um, their orbits are very close to each other. So at closest approach between the two planets, they're only five times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So from, from each other. So we don't know of any other planets whose orbits are so close together. But um, 36b, which is the surface here, uh, is probably a rocky planet. And 36c is similar to Neptune. So if you were standing on the surface of 36b and looking up during when the um, 36C is making its close approach. Uh, 36C would look much, much bigger in the sky than, than the moon looks in our sky. Now we're getting to the possibly habitable planets. Uh, Kepler 186f is the first Earth-sized planet that we found in the habitable zone, but it's not an Earth twin because the star that it orbits is not like our sun. It's about half the size of the sun, so it's cooler, it's redder. So if you were standing on the planet's surface, things would probably look kind of reddish because of the light that you're getting from the star. 452b, on the other hand, may actually be an Earth twin. It's a little bit bigger than the Earth, um, but the star is very like our sun. It's only a little bit older than our sun. The, um, and its year is actually 385 days, so only 20 days longer than our year. So this is... Um, one of the best Earth twin candidates that Kepler has. And then lastly, we have the Kepler 223 system. So this system looks like it could be sort of uh, an analog of, could be a twin of our early Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune before their orbits scattered um, and changed. And so instead of the orbits drastically changing, you just get um, a slow migration of all the planets in towards the center, in towards the star, and they stay in these nice, stable, relatively stable orbits. So this is um, giving us clues about how planetary migration goes on, and one of the possible explanations for why this system stayed stable and our system did not. Could be that there were just not as many um, little icy remnants in, the, the, in this particular system to scatter off the planets and cause the um, chaos. So to wrap up, uh, what are some of the questions that Kepler answered? Uh, we've found that small planets are indeed quite common. Um, hot Jupiters are actually not as common as we first thought they might be. Um, Earth-sized planets could actually form fairly early on in the universe's, universe's history. Multi-planet multi systems are not rare. Um, and planets can form around binary stars and even multi-star systems. Some of the unanswered questions, though, that Kepler has raised are, what are these sub-Neptunes? Um, are they water worlds? Is there some other explanation? Are they scaled down Neptunes? Um, how do they form? Um, another question is why planets like uh, in Kepler 2223, why do they migrate gently while others like our solar system are chaotic? Uh, how do planets end up in these really compact, stable systems where you have five or six planets inside the or orbit of Mercury? Um, are these close, hot in planets lava oceans? Are they something even more strange? Uh, and how common are long-period planets? Because Kepler only, um, 
Kepler was only receiving data for four years. So anything with longer periods, we, we wouldn't have been able to find because there wouldn't have been enough time to see a couple of the transits of the star. So Kepler doesn't give us any information on long period planets. Um, again, for reference, Jupiter is at a 12 year orbit. So we're, we're not even approaching Jupiter type planets around our sun. Uh, so, as I said, the original Kepler mission uh, only lasted four years. It ended, unfortunately, due to hardware failure. It was no longer able to continue to stare at the same field that it had been looking at. Uh, but fortunately, the uh, engineers found a clever way to continue the mission. They were able to balance the spacecraft using the light from the sun uh, to keep the... the spacecraft stabilized and so the Kepler mission lives on as K2 and the search continues. Thank you. Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, let me see if I got this right. Actually, I'm not sure what... what yeah. Okay, so are the, the stars uh, that these planets are orbiting, are they the same size as our sun, or are they, they different, right? Okay, so some of them are, some of them were sun-like. Um, there were a few that are a little bit smaller, some are a little bit bigger. So, so not all of them are the same size as our sun, but a lot of them in this particular selection were. Was there a particular planet that you had a question about, or just in general? Yeah, um, it will, it will, the biggest effect mostly is, is kind of where that habitable zone will be. So smaller stars, the habitable zone is going to be much closer in. Uh, bigger stars, it's going to be even further out than, if it's bigger than our, our sun, it's going to be further out. Um, that's, I think, the biggest difference between the stars. Plus the, the, um, just the, the color of the light that you receive is going to be different because the smaller stars are usually cooler as well. Yeah, so the, the question is, um, with James, James Webb Space Telescope coming up, is there a lot of buzz in the, the specific community that I'm in um, about the information that we'll get? And yes, we're, we're definitely very excited about uh, atmospheric information that we'll get, um, being able to, to, to study these things with, with much, much greater power than we've had before. So there's definitely, we've got plans, we're working on it. <laughs> we're definitely hoping it goes off on schedule. <laughs> Uh, yeah, down here. Um, I the the question is that there's a, a planet with a 395 day orbit. Um, is it close to us? I'm actually not familiar offhand with that planet. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> uh, in the back. Okay, so the question is um, uh, if there's any explanation as to why some planets form really close to each other, whereas in the solar system you have a lot of space in between them. Um, 
I don't know if there's a, one specific accepted explanation, but the explanation that I would think of off the top of my head is just that uh, probably there's migration happening. So the planets form and then they might move closer together or something. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think there was over here. Okay, so the question is, uh, if we know generally what the time scale is for planet formation, and if the planets form before or after the sun, or the star forms. Uh, so the planets probably start forming around the same time that the, the star starts to form. Um, basically the planets are probably, when the sun, the star starts uh, nuclear fusion, and it, it really lights up. Uh, that's basically when the, the, the disk will clear out and uh, planet formation mostly stops. I mean, you might get some large collisions between things, um, particularly like the collision that we think started the moon, or created the moon. Uh, but for the most part, the planet formation ends. And that's usually on the order of maybe 100 million years or so after the, the, uh, the star starts forming, not after it ends. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, it could be. I would actually have to run the numbers with the, the mass and the radius to, to actually know for sure. But it, it could be stronger, yeah. Um, but, I mean, there's nothing special about us forming on Earth, right? Like, just because 1G here doesn't mean you need 1G anywhere else to, to be habitable. Uh-huh. Okay. So the question is if there's a correlation between how often you find the, the compact uh, systems and the size of the star. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe so. I don't, not to my knowledge. Um, I haven't actually looked at the numbers myself, but I haven't heard of anything like that. Okay. Um, somebody from the back. Any question? Like way in the back. Yes, that's a good question. So the the planets that are bigger than us, if they have liquid water on their surface, would the water be different? Uh, would it have different physical properties uh, because of the stronger gravity? Um, Depends on how much stronger, but yes, if you start putting pressure on water, it does very strange things. You can get ice to form at very high temperatures. Um, yeah, so it could be very different even though it's water. Uh, one more question? Yes, mentioned, uh, stars, like yep. Would the be so for the four star system, would the, the orbits be exotic? Um, probably not. So in this case, the, the two pairs of stars are very f separated from each other. And so um, they're probably not coming close together at all. So the planet around the one pair probably doesn't really know about the other pair that much. Um, it's mostly feeling just the effects of the, the pair that it's close to. Well, I think that's it. Let's uh, thank Holly again. Thank you.
Tech tries to uh, solve some issues that the original team model has. Yeah. The problem is people each tweaking their own model. Yeah,